Okay, so we have already uh, spoken a little bit about incentive problems between company owners and company managers. And what we've very quickly alluded to, maybe, I can't remember if I actually did this, uh, but uh, uh, um, some of these incentive problems can be alleviated by carefully designing managerial compensation schemes. So ideally, what you want to do is you want to reward the manager for doing the right thing, um, punish them for doing the bad thing, so basically design a pay for performance scheme. The question is, how, do you ex how exactly do you evaluate managerial performance? So, um, you can tie it to company profits, you can tie it to stock price, the, the salary of the manager. And in the end, you want to design a scheme that would incentivize the manager the most, but would be as cheap for you as a shareholder as possible. So yeah, that's what I just told. Uh, let's do a very, very quick and simple model of this that will help us see this. So you have a manager, we have shareholders, and there is also some, some stock market in the background. Now there is some fundamental value of the firm. Uh, you can think of it as um, the realized profits that will materialize. Uh, we'll call it big V, and it can be high or low. So VH or VL. The probability of a good outcome is now not exogenous, so this theta, uh, but it depends on whether the manager works hard or not, whether the manager exerts effort or not. So if, if he does, then the probability of a high outcome, outcome theta is high. If he does not, this probability is low. However, exerting effort is costly for the manager. So it takes cost C to actually work. Um, but shareholders would like to incentivize the manager to exert effort. Now, uh, say that the normalize the outside option of the manager to zero. So. Um, the manager has nothing better to do than to work for this firm. And we want to design a salary scheme for this manager. So choose wages. And for sake of limited liability, we'll say that these salaries are non-negative. So manager, we cannot force the manager to pay us, which is quite often, I think, the case in reality. Um, and why do we need the stock market? is we say that the stock price will be informative of the manager manager's effort. So the thing about effort is it is not contractible. So when we hire the manager, we cannot really um, put it in the contract that if you work hard, you'll get a lot of money. If you don't work hard, you'll get less money. We need to specify what exactly it means to work hard and it's just difficult to specify it in terms of effort. So the company cannot make its um, uh, salary schedule, manager's salary schedule contingent on the effort, but it can make it contingent on uh, company value. So the realized profits, say, or it can make it contingent on the stock price. And so what we will assume is that effort is not contractible, but it is visible. So everyone can see whether the manager works or not. We just cannot prove it in court. In particular, the market also observes manager's effort. And so trades the stock at uh, the expected value. So the stock price will be equal to the expected value of V conditional on effort. So the first best contract in this setting if a company could make a contract contingent on effort, would be to 
pay the manager C if the manager exerted effort and pay the manager zero otherwise. In this case, the manager would be indifferent between both options. So say he would get C and then exert cost C um, to, to actually work, or he can do nothing, get nothing at zero cost. Both yield zero in the end, but um, say we can pay him C plus one dollar. In that case, he'll prefer to work, right? So this is the best thing that we could have possibly done as shareholders. But now let us go back to the world where the effort is not contractible and see what we can do there. So as I told you, we can make uh, this contract contingent on one of the two things. First, let's see what happens, how, how good of a contract can we make if we make manager's compensation contingent on company value or realized profits. I realize now that it's a little misleading because company value is kind of the same as stock price or very close to that. So, but by value, uh, let's mean realized profits. Okay. So then the incentive constraint of the manager, the condition for the manager to be willing to actually work will look like this. So the the change in the probability of achieving um, high outcome, high profits, theta upper bar minus theta lower bar, times the difference in wages that this generates, so the wage premium for a good outcome, must be greater than or equal to um, the cost of effort. So if premium for effort is larger, then the uh, manager is willing to work. And so the shareholder's problem is finding such WH and WL that minimize the expected payments to the manager. So they want to minimize expected W subject to this constraint. So they want to find the cheapest contract which incentivizes the manager to work. And if you do the motions, you will arrive at this. Here, um, the manager will get nothing after if the company fails, if the company achieves a low outcome, and the manager will get a high payment if, uh, if, if the company performs well. Now let's look at the other case and let's see what can we do if we make our payments contingent on the stock price. Here we'll have one price if the manager has exerted effort and another price if the manager has exerted no effort. So if we design, if we choose these two wages after, for these two possible stock prices, we can basically achieve first best, right? Because the stock price tells us perfectly whether the manager was exerting effort or not. I mean, we know it regardless, but stock price allows us to prove it in court. So the optimal contract is the same as the first best contract um, that we got. And if you calculate the expected payments generated by these two contracts, you'll see that can, um, this first, this contract contingent on the stock price is actually cheaper. I guess you can already know that from the fact that it is the same as first best contract, which is the cheapest by, by definition, by design. So, one, the, the reason, the main reason it's cheaper is because it's more sensitive to the worker's effort, to the manager's effort. So, in this stock price contract, manager's compensation is directly defined by his effort, while in the company performance um, contract, manager's compensation is still random conditional on effort and um, if actually if we could assign negative wages so if we could have negative WL then we could do the same as first best but we cannot so we have this limited liability 
to be a binding constraint. Okay, so if you want to know more about designing optimal incentive schemes under hidden or non-contractable actions, then you can take contract theory course this next fall, because that's more or less what uh, you will do there. And we, in the meanwhile, will move on. No, we'll not move on. Uh, just to outline one possible issue that may come up with tying managerial compensation to stock price. Um, it's, it's not a panacea, it's not a cure-all, it's not a perfect solution to the problem, because it, as most other things, it may lead to unintended consequences. In particular, it might lead to um, bad outcomes if there is some hidden information in addition to hidden action. In particular, if the manager's ability or competence is not certain and the manager would like to would like everyone to believe that he is competent or smart or able. This uh, leads to the problem of career concerns. And the manager will not just maximize their monetary compensation, but they will also try to maximize their reputation. And this might lead to various inefficiencies. Um, yeah, it may distort, distort things in all directions. On the one hand, uh, if the CEO is afraid of appearing incompetent, they may forego some risky, but on average attractive investment opportunities. Because if they fail, well, everyone will think that this is because the CEO is stupid. Um, the CEO will not find another job after that. Or, you know, the exact opposite may happen. So if benefits for reputation are convex, if you want to be the next Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or um, your other business hero, and you don't care that much about failure, then you will take on too much risk. Because the history remembers winners, the history does not remember losers all that well. Uh, so if you want to live your market history, you want to take too much risk in the hopes of being the 0.001% that uh, succeed in this risky venture. Okay, but yeah, let us move on. So we have established that the company may care about what happens to its stock price in the secondary market. In particular, if we assume that uh, the company actually cares about its stock price, which they most often do. Because, well, shareholders want to actually know what their wealth is, what is the value of the stocks they're holding, they want to maximize it. Uh, if this is the case, which it is, then the company may be willing to improve the liquidity of its stocks. Because as we learned last time, higher liquidity means that the stocks are more valuable. So this is something that shareholders might want to do. And the question is, what are the instruments that the firm has in affecting this liquidity. So I can offer you three. One, the trivial one is obviously doing an IPO, listing your stocks on the exchange. Or if you're already listed, you can always list on another exchange, right? This, this will improve your liquidity. This will make your stocks to be more easily um, accessible by a lot of investors. Of course, listing typically comes at a cost. You must prepare all the documents, you must um, be very transparent if you are a publicly traded company, so you must be willing to provide very transparent financial reports, and so on. So there are many reasons for which you might not want to do this. For example, you don't want to give you this information to your competitors. Or you might not give that much information to the tax authorities if you're doing some 
creative accounting, let's call it. So it is a costly way, but it is uh, typically worth it because, well, just by revealed preference. We can see a lot of companies being traded on these exchanges, so they must find it worth it, right? Another thing you can do, if you are already traded on an exchange, if your stocks are already listed in an exchange, or if you are traded on one of the big OTC platforms, which are not that much different from exchanges except for uh, transparency requirements, then what you can do is hire a dedicated market maker for your own stocks. So apparently it's a thing that's relatively popular in Europe. Uh, what companies do is they can hire a market maker uh, who will just post relatively aggressive limit orders on both sides of the book. So this will shorten the spread and uh, improve liquidity. Now this is not quite the same as a hybrid market that we discussed a few weeks back. So if you remember, uh, we spoke when we talked about market design for order driven markets, we said, well, what would happen if we put a dealer uh, together with a limit or a book, right? And there were some um, bad consequences stemming out from that. But those were coming because the dealer could observe the order flow and the limit traders could not. So this kind of inefficiency does not really arise in this setting. Right here, our market maker would be just exactly as knowledgeable as other traders. So other traders would be not much less reluctant to trade if um, the company hires such a dedicated market maker. And finally, if the company has um, multiple uh, how do you say, multiple channels of financing. So it has many different kinds of stocks. It has uh, also issued a few different issues of bonds. Then, um, you know, all of these different issues, all of these different assets may have different liquidity. So the company might increase its overall liquidity by choosing a capital structure which is optimal in this respect. So say if it's easier, if your shares are more liquid than your bonds, then you might be willing to fund your next investment project through equity rather than debt. Because well, these are more liquid, these, uh, this would allow for cheaper, cheaper money. Of course, this, this is a very minor concern when you're choosing between equity and debt financing. I would say that this is probably the least of your concerns. But if you're interested in learning more about this choice, then corporate finance is a field that has been studying this choice for the past 40, 50 years. I'm not sure if they've converged to an answer yet, but they're trying. So I believe in our department we have uh, two courses on corporate finance and both of them I think are offered in fall. So they were offered last fall, they will, they will probably be out there next fall. But um, yeah, corporate finance is, is kind of the course that explores the primary capital markets in a lot more detail than we do in this course. And this is it. That's it for corporate governance and its connection with financial markets. And uh, if there are no questions on this, then we will move on to exploring the digital markets, a completely unrelated topic, or at least somewhat unrelated. So I will start with this uh, quote that um, relates the progression of financial market to Moore's law. So the quote says, it should come as no surprise then that the financial system exhibits a Moore's law of its own. 
From 1929 to 2009, the total market capitalization of the US stock market has doubled every decade. The total trading volume of stocks in the Dow Jones Industrial Average doubled every seven and a half years during this period. But in the most recent decade, this pace has accelerated. Now the doubling occurs every 2.9 years, growing almost as fast as the semiconductor industry. And uh, I presume you're familiar with Moore's law, just in case you're not. Uh, it's a law, empirical law about processing power of computers. It says that computers become twice as powerful and twice as cheap every two years. It has been devised, I know, in the 60s or 70s. It's been holding up for the most part. Uh, it's slowed down, slowed down a little bit recently. But you can still say that, it's, that it holds. And this quote uh, argues that kind of the same thing happens in uh, financial markets. Market capital capitalization doubles, trading volume um, also increases geometrically. And it, it's a kind of nice leading in their paper uh, to argue that the two are connected. So financial markets are developing because computers are developing. So we'll take that as granted. Uh, this discussion of digital markets will will progress in two stages. So we will start by taking stock of the past 20, 30, 40 years, so taking this kind of macro perspective, and we will try to see how has the digitization and computerization of everything uh, transformed the financial markets. So the quote above already mentions the uh, kind of extensive margin of this transformation, which is a fancy way of saying um, the computerization allowed there to be more trading. But we'll, let us also discuss at discuss the intensive margin and discuss how different is trading now from trading 50 years ago. So how has the nature of interactions in financial markets been transformed? Uh, I guess one thing to point out that these guys point out in their paper, and that's actually how their paper is called, Moore's Law and Murphy's Law, I think? No? Let me check. Yeah, Moore's Law versus Murphy's Law. That's it. Um, they say Murphy's Law does not fail either, and Murphy's Law you are definitely familiar with. It says that everything that can go wrong will go wrong. And um, so one, one consequence of uh, computerization digitization is uh, all the world and financial markets in particular have become more integrated, they have become more interdependent. And so failures are now more, sen more hurting than, e than ever. And 2008 recession was one example of that. So it, the scope for failures is as big as ever with these global integrated markets. But it's more about integration, less about digital markets, although on second thought I guess you can blame, you, you definitely can blame computers for globalization, so this is one consequence. So the way we'll structure this first big history trip is we will use it to take a look back at our course. And uh, we'll look at all the different factors that feed into uh, the markets, all different factors that determine how the trading proceeds in the markets, how efficient the markets are, how liquid the markets are. So we will take stock of these factors and we will see how digital mar markets, how the digitization has transformed, how has, 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 has influenced these factors uh, through... Let me try to say it again. 
We'll try to see how the digitization has affected the financial markets through every single one of these channels. That's better. And so the way we'll do it is in the form of a quiz or a series of quizzes. So for every factor or almost every factor I will ask you to answer. And these are very quick, quick questions, so I'll not give you any time to think. And uh, I want you to take a second now to refresh the stream, or at least pause and play it, uh, just in case you have fallen behind due to all the buffering. So this is all just to make sure that you're answering the same question as everyone else and not falling too far behind. Okay, so let us start with trading costs. Just the plain simple general trading costs. What was the effect of market digitization on trading costs? Has it increased them or decreased them? All twos, of course, you're correct. Uh, plain and simple as I promised. Uh, trade transaction costs are really much lower right now than they were 50 years ago. To buy a stock uh, now costs only a few buttons, rather than calling a broker, best case scenario, but worst case scenario, walk into the bank trying to find out whom I should talk to in order to buy a stock. Uh, so yeah, things are much easier these days. So moving on. What was the effect of market digitization on the investor's risk aversion? And here I mean it in respect to any given particular stock. Are investors more or less willing to buy risky stocks? One, two, two, one. So the votes have split. Uh, and this is a less trivial question than the previous one. I would want to say that um, risk aversion has decreased, so investors are more willing to now take risky positions, simply because they can diversify this risk away more easily. So it's easier for them in general to calculate and then implement a portfolio that minimizes uh, risk given some composition of the assets and this effectively um, leads to investors being more willing to buy any, any given risky assets so maybe investors risk aversion is not the best way to put it because it kind of implies the total aggregate risk aversion and if you interpret it this way then maybe um, it, it could be true that risk aversion has increased because now investors have access to a lot wider spectrum of assets, meaning that their demand, that their demands towards their portfolio are more stringent. So they want to have a more risk-free portfolio because they are able to, to do it. I was not able to formulate this channel as well as I could, so maybe maybe it's not that good of a channel. I don't know. But let's move on. I will not ask you about this one. I guess I've already mentioned it at some point. Uh, but the digitiza digitization has affected the way markets are organized. Trivially. So basically these days you can use algorithms to cross the orders automatically to match those who are willing to buy with those who are willing to sell if there is a scope for a profitable trade so this role of the algorithms means that there is less um, less work for dealers so you no longer need a dealer really in the market which um, shifted the balance quite a bit towards order driven markets and it's took some jobs away from dealers in dealer-based markets. 
Fragmentation. So this is a very interesting one. But what you say was the effect of market digitization on market fragmentation? So we have um, two, two, two. Th there are definitely many ways in which you can approach this project. And uh, yet another two. Uh, there are many ways in which you can approach this question, not a project. I guess it could be a project if you want to. But many ways in which you can approach this um, question. I also chose two. So now um, the way I thought about it is Distance is much less of a factor, so you no longer need to have a market in every town, in every city. So markets kind of have consolidated, right? It's not that much of a drawback for me now if I need to trade in New York rather than Copenhagen. It is inconvenient in terms of trading time, but I can still do it at relatively low cost. So um, it is probable that some regional markets uh, have seen their significance quite diminished over time. So really this is more of a my guess, I don't have any data to back that up, so don't take my word for granted on this one. But the other and the more important even channel is that the, ro the role of fragmentation, the impact of fragmentation has itself diminished greatly over time because of exactly the same reason, right? I don't really care much if trading in some given asset is now fragmented over five different exchanges because it's much easier for me to gather information about how this asset is traded on, five, on these five exchanges. It's much easier for me to do it now than it was 50 years ago or even 80 years ago where you would have to wait a few days for a telegraph response again my guess i'm now thinking that it might be interesting to read a book about stock markets in 1930s or so how they were organized if you know such a book send me a recommendation or a tv show um, that might be very interesting. Okay, but moving on, proceeding with our course. Um, what about transparency? So what was the effect of market digitization on market transparency? Has it increased or decreased? One, one, one. Uh, yeah, I agree. This was one of the simpler ones. Um, although there, there are once again issues on both sides of the argument. So all of what I just said uh, accounts for the fact that accessing information is now easier than ever. Um, it's much easier for me to access information from markets halfway across the planet. But, you know, there might be some exceptions to this rule. In particular, if you are a trader on a physical trading floor, then you can see a lot. You can see who trades with whom, you can see what is traded, you can probably overhear what is the price, what is the quantity. So it might be a little difficult to hide from that. Of course it's very visible if everyone just shouts transactions at one another. as it as it is or as it was the case in many physical trading floors. In the digital markets, on the other hand, this kind of information can be concealed, so it's much easier to hide the trading flow, it is much easier to make trading more anonymous, it is much easier to, uh, well, 
block access to any different kinds of information. Yeah. So let's say this spectrum of possibility, the spectrum of possible um, degrees of transparency that you can implement in a given financial market these days is much wider than it was uh, in the old days, in the physical trading floors. But um, it's not as immediate the transparency has increased, although it has for the most part. Another aspect that, you, that we can think of is uh, latency. And latency is another thing that has obviously also decreased. And latency, I interpret it as a time between uh, you submitting your order and it being executed. So once again, in, in the analog world, you would have to call the broker, then the broker would have to call the dealer, then the dealer would have to find a match. So it could have taken a long time. Or, you know, no, let me leave it there. These days with electronic platforms, uh, it can be not hours, not even minutes, not even seconds, but the count is on milliseconds. So the trading is a lot, a lot faster these days. And this uh, has um, produced a lot of new trading kind of meta strategies, new approaches to trading. For example, arbitrage is now almost instantaneous. So if you're a few milliseconds too late, the arbitrage is gone. So... And Arbitrage is a good thing, right? Uh, if there are arbitrageurs who are taking care of that, of market di discrepancies, of price discrepancies across uh, the same asset trading traded at different platforms, they are f these arbitrageurs are fostering price discovery. They are making sure that prices are accurate everywhere, or they, that prices are balanced across markets. So this is kind of a good thing, right? Of course, this this uh, greater speed of trading has probably eliminated some trading strategies of the past, so it cannot be that everyone's a winner, although I'm not, I cannot give you an example of what particular that was. But in the end, this faster trading produced more trading, I would say. So uh, it led to higher trading volume and liquidity. A question in chat. Are we going to get a quiz or true-false question for the exam? I would think not. So I, I did consider um, uh, adding some multiple choice questions for the exam, for the ease of grading, to be honest. But I don't think I will do it in the end, so I think the exam will be quite close to the problem sets. So there will be some problems, relatively large problems uh, that deal with models, and there will be a few more of a essay questions, uh, maybe about some readings that I will assign. But um, probably no multiple choice questions. They're easy to grade, but they are very difficult to set up. And if you if you really look at uh, what we do here, these quiz questions are either quite trivial or they are more of a guessing game. Okay, so going back to latency, this decreased latency has um, really brought to light the issue of heterogeneity of latency across investors. Of course, it's not the case that latency was the same for everyone back in the day, so it was still different for professional traders and for uh, retail traders, because retail traders had to go through more steps to get their trade done. But uh, these days, it, this high-frequency trading, the issue of having the fastest access to the market is really brought to light. And the reason is uh, because a lot of companies, some companies, are really investing a lot of money 
into getting the fastest access to the market. I'm sure all of you have heard about um, this group of financial companies who put their own internet cable between Chicago and New York just to shave one or two milliseconds of latency. So I can't, I can't remember if these were New York traders getting access to Chicago exchange or Chicago traders getting access to New York exchanges. The second feels uh, more reasonable. But they definitely did that. The absolute madman. So the cost of this project was, of course, a lot of millions, hundreds of millions probably. So the question immediately came up. Is this a good thing? Are these guys doing something that's valuable for the society in general? Or are they just wasting money uh, to harm everyone else? To exploit the slow traders? And we will look at this issue in greater detail next week. Our next lecture will be all devoted to high-frequency trading. And we'll see a couple of models of that. Uh, and the answer will, as usual, be it's not really clear. There are some costs, there are some benefits to HFT. So this, I believe, does not conclude our uh, historical journey. Uh, because we have one more issue. One more um, new feature that was produced by the, di the, the digitization, the computerization of uh, markets, is the algorithmic trading. So now you do not need to um, submit all of the orders yourself. You can design an algorithm that will trade on your behalf. So you can tell the algorithm, you know, if, if this price goes there and this price goes there, then submit this market order. This was something that was definitely not possible before computers. I guess, well, Limit orders are the simplest version of such an algorithmic order, but um, now algorithms can be a lot more sophisticated. So I want to emphasize that this is close but not quite the same as HFT. All HFT is of course algorithmic, because no human can conceivably react uh, at a few millisecond latency. But algorithmic trading can also be slow, right? I can just um, put an algorithm that will say that will sell automatically if the price of my portfolio drops too low, just to fix the losses, right? And this would make me able to not monitor the market closely, not to monitor the market price, but rather trust in the algorithm to do it. Now this has also greatly improved. Uh, market liquidity, the amount of orders in the market. This ability to hedge more easily has made, once again, the traders maybe more willing to take risks. Because they know that they are less exposed to these risks. If that makes sense, which probably doesn't. But let's suppose it does. So this made the markets more liquid, but also more fragile. Because the thing about these algorithms is they are quite often correlated meaning that all the different traders uh, they put in kind of a um, very similar algorithmic orders and this can lead to quite abrupt market crashes so this survey by Carolyn Law that I've quoted quite a few times already is really a survey about algorithmic trading in particular, not so much about digital markets in general. And um, they have five, I think, at least stories for how, um, of when algorithmic trading led to quite a few market crashes. So the story quite often proceeds uh, in the similar way. The stock price drops because of maybe some market neutral but large order. But then some algorithms kick in to fix losses, so they submit more sell orders uh, on this asset because they're trying to get rid of the asset that's uh, dropping. So they create more pressure on the sell side of the market. This lowers the price even further 
and activates more algorithms and so on. So given that this loop unravels very very quickly, this can really lead to very significant market impact. And if you're interested in particular stories, I really encourage you to read this survey. It's published in an academic economic journal, uh, Journal of Economic Perspectives, I believe. But it's really um, more of a collection of stories. So they first go into history of what made algorithmic trading possible, and then they basically tell about all of these screw-ups that happened throughout the recent history. Uh, here, let me take a quick digression. I promised you that I will add some readings to the syllabus on the, on the digital markets. And there were basically two that I had in mind. This one and another one that we'll get to in a second. Um, I opted not to because they do not really correspond to what I'm talking about. So I will not be assigning any mandatory readings for the digital, digital markets. But uh, I still encourage you to read those, those as optional readings, especially if you are interested in the topic. And another small digression, apparently I lied yet again about finishing early. I will take another maybe 5 to 10 minutes. Sorry, yet again, last week repeats. Uh, but at least my speech is a little more coherent this week, I hope. Another thing that you can uh, do if you're interested in the topic is taking the Digital Economics Seminar this upcoming fall. Are you interested in researching uh, the, the impacts, the effects of digitization on markets, on the economy in general? Then this seminar is for you. So basically what, um, yeah, I just heard the word yesterday that this seminar was approved. And I will be teaching this one, unlike all of the courses, all of the other courses that I advertised today. So this gives you better information on whether you should take it or stay as far away from it as you can. Uh, but basically what the seminar is about is, yeah, the impact of digitization in markets and the example of Research projects that you can do within the seminar is uh, investigate the impacts of consumer tracking in markets, of personalized advertising, um, look at the impacts of social media on social learning. So it's not really that much about digital financial markets so much as it is about the consumer markets and consumer participants. But if you really want to you can think about digital financial markets within that seminar as well. And with that, we are finally getting to the topic of blockchain and cryptocurrencies. The hottest trend of 2017. Uh, yeah, I had Bitcoin price chart somewhere. So in 2017, Bitcoin price increased by about 20 times from 6,000 kroners to 126,000 kroners. So this was quite a big bubble. Every, every housewife was talking about Bitcoin, same as they are about COVID today, of course. But uh, then nothing really happened off of it. It did not become the new global currency. It did not become the new big investment device. But it's still a, quite a popular topic in fintech literature. So the folks have not really abandoned this idea. Um, so let us talk a little bit about how this works and what are the problems with all of this. So just to... Excuse me. Just to establish the vocabulary a little bit. Uh, blockchain and cryptocurrencies are quite often used interchangeably and you know Bitcoin is often used as a name for all of it uh, These are slightly of course different things. So blockchain is overall the technology of a distributed ledger so it's a um, technology of 
collectively creating, collectively recording the history of something. So cryptocurrencies, in particular, use this blockchain technology to record the history of transactions with um, their own internal currency. So Bitcoin, in aggregate, is a huge ledger that um, or that lists every transaction in Bitcoin that has ever happened. And that's it. Um, so, just a quick note, in addition to what we'll be talking about below, uh, this is the second paper that I thought of assigning. It is a more kind of economic-oriented survey about cryptocurrencies. So if you're interested, you can take a look at that. I did not find it to be extremely enlightening, but this is one of the few references that I could actually find. So why do we care about this in relation to financial markets? Now, um, starting with cryptocurrencies, because they are, they were the popular thing back in the day. Uh, the way you should think about those is they are like distributed payment systems, right? So they are like Visa or MasterCard. You can use those to, uh, instead of cash, to pay somebody. And if I decide to go to grocery stores and, and pay with Bitcoin, then they would basically be able to see in that distributed ledger, in that transaction history, that I actually paid them. So this is kind of a guarantee that I paid them. So this is how cryptocurrencies work. But cryptocurrencies are not quite the same as financial markets. But we can translate that mechanism, that general approach, to financial markets. In particular, so one example in which you can do it is say that coins are shares of some company. And the history allows you to uniquely determine who possesses the shares at any given point in time and who traded these shares to whom. And you would not need any kind of uh, centralized exchange for that. So you would be able to do these transactions in this kind of decentralized uh, network way. Another way you can think about it is um, setting up the whole decentralized exchange this way and it would also record stock transactions in this blockchain but this um, might not help you to determine uniquely who actually possesses these uh, stocks because the, um, there might be transactions outside of this platform Unless you, of course, integrate the two approaches. So that's kind of the way that you should think of um, possible application to blockchain to financial markets. So what are the goods and bads of, say, setting up such an exchange or uh, issuing your shares as a form of cryptocurrency, effectively? How would this work? Why would this work? One benefit that was widely perceived is decentralization. So you no longer need an intermediary in your trade, you no longer need an exchange, a trading platform uh, to do the transaction. And this is good because, well, all of these platforms are self-interested, right? They are operating at a profit. So they take their cut, they take order processing fees, they take transaction fees, and if you cut out this intermediary, this would probably make the market more efficient, right? Because this would reduce the transaction costs. Furthermore, these markets are by design quite often transparent. So if you think of um, blockchain like Bitcoin, which is completely decentralized and anyone can um, participate in mining in producing this blockchain 
then just by design the whole transaction history is observable to everyone. The whole order flow is observable to everyone. And furthermore, you can actually observe the trading history of your counterparty. You can see how much they bought, how much they sold, when, at what price. So it really promotes a lot of transparency. And um, if you remember from a few weeks back, transparency is good for the uninformed traders. It is not that good for more informed traders. So um, it's easy to see why a lot of people were really excited about this transparency aspect of, of uh, blockchain. It does not fully apply to blockchain, which is also not fully decentralized. So you can think that still there are... Um, that blockchain is produced by a few trusted parties, but it's not public, so not everyone can mine. We are kind of ignoring that thing a little bit. I'm not sure how we can use that. The one last advantage... No, sorry, before we go there. A one common misperception about Bitcoin and all that stuff is that it's a very anonymous currency. But the thing is, it's not. There is very little anonymity to those public cr cryptocurrency. Z. Exactly because your whole trading history in a given wallet, wallet is perfectly visible. And even if you split across all the different wallets and uh, try to hide and disguise trading flows, we can still see the whole transaction history, so someone will be able to trace the flows to somewhere. So, you know, anonymity is not really a thing with um, these blockchains. But one final uh, benefit of public blockchains and blockchain technology in general is smart contracts. So I believe Ethereum has those, maybe some others have those. I, I am not super proficient in how these work, but you can basically think of these as an um, advanced version of algorithmic trading or kind of bilateral algorithmic trading. So one use case that I could think of for smart contracts is um, future or forward contracts. Right there, somewhat, they are quite easy to implement in this uh, smart contract environment. So say, I promise to... Uh, I promise to you today at some maybe payment uh, that I'll give you the difference between future market price of some asset and uh, some benchmark price that we agree upon today, right? You can design it as a smart contract and in that case I will not be able to renege on my promise so it alleviates maybe counterparty risk to some extent but um, that's one cool thing that is typically associated with blockchain but I'm sorry that I cannot provide you more insight now what are the disadvantages of blockchain public blockchain in particular now we want to start with probably limited processing capacity. Now the way that um, at least Bitcoin is organized is that the block size, meaning that uh, the um, number of transactions that you can basically process per unit of time and the frequency of these blocks are more or less fixed. In Ethereum, I think block size is uh, flexible. So you have some flexibility a little bit. But... Uh, so this is probably not a universal drawback, but it uh, applies to, to some extent at least, to existing cryptocurrencies at least. So I'm not sure if you can design a financial market that's fully rid of this drawback. Uh, so this is obviously a huge drawback because it means you cannot process as many transactions as you want. So if your market grows. If you remember that quote that we had today, if your trading volume doubles every few years, then um, you will hit the ceiling sooner or later. So you will not be able to process all transactions that are submitted to the blockchain. 
which leads to competition. So it leads to order cost and execution risk. Basically how it happens in blockchain, I believe, is that along with the transaction that you want to be recorded, you are also offering some uh, premium to the miner. So some basically reward for including your particular transaction into the next block and not uh, someone else's transaction. So this basically brings us back to the order costs that we thought we eliminated. Right? We still have order costs here, but we're just paying them to a different intermediary. And um, I know I'm going way over time. I apologize about that. Uh, I guess there will be a YouTube video exposed, so you can refer to that if you want. But we'll finish in another five minutes, I think. I hope. So, not much left. So, okay, you, you still have those order costs. And now you also have the extra execution risk due to these due to this bidding for transactions. So you might offer some reward to the miner for including your transaction, but it might not be high enough and you might be outbid and then your transaction is not included in the next block. And so then you would have to wait for the block after to try and bid again. So this execution risk is on top of any kind of execution risk that you might have from other sources or limit orders. Now, as you can probably guess, this produces yet another uh, drawback, which is delay, which is now random due to this execution risk. But the thing is, blocks are only processed uh, rarely. I think for Bitcoin it's about one per 10 minutes, maybe six minutes, but somewhere in that ballpark. So unlike with Visa or MasterCard, where your transaction is verified pretty much immediately, or in financial markets where your transaction is once again verified very quickly, here you actually have to wait for at least 10 minutes to make sure that your transaction went through. So I would have to wait for 10 minutes in the grocery store checkout for the store to verify that I did actually pay them for my groceries. That's one of the big reasons Bitcoin is not the big ultimate currency these days. Um, so I actually had one cool graph here. I'll go over it very quickly. Uh, going back to the order costs. I, no, you don't want to go there? Okay. Here it is. Um, so this is the graph of Bitcoin order processing fees averaged throughout the day over the past um, nine months nine months or so so way after this Bitcoin hype one thing you can see here is that it's really volatile it's not anywhere near smooth it has these huge jumps from day to day so not even from block to block but from day to day these are quite significant right so if a transaction cost in a given day is low I think the the, the, the way it goes transaction cost is low that makes traders more willing to trade so they come to the market they flood it with transactions competition intensifies so the order cost increases this drives the market some market participants away which is, eases the competition and drives transaction costs down yet again i'm not sure why it does not stabilize in equilibrium but this is just one thing that um, happens. So not only you have order cost, but this order cost is quite uncertain. So it's yet another risk factor to incorporate in your decision making. If you also look very closely at this graph, you'll notice that a lot of these have sort of have M-shaped pattern. I have absolutely no idea why that is. But it seems, to me at least, like it's really present in the data. Maybe I'm seeing things, but this is really bizarre to me, this M shape. Okay, so that's just a graph that I wanted to show you. Um, going back to our drawbacks, 
of Bitcoin, blockchain, and all of that. You have um, an issue with clearing and settlement. So when you are trading on a on an established exchange, you have a trusted mediator, and this intermediary kind of absorbs uh, the counterparty risk. So this intermediary takes it upon itself to make sure that if you if your order to buy or sell went through, then your money is taken and your asset is delivered to you, or vice versa. And if the other party has reneged, excuse me, on the transaction, then uh, well, the exchange will just absorb this risk. Um, so without this intermediary, your counterparty risk intensifies. And that's basically one of the reasons why we want intermediaries in the market, even if they contribute to order costs a little bit. Finally, without the exchange without the requ the financial transparency requirements for being traded on the exchange um, it's really difficult to force the firm to disclose its financial reportings so the firm fundamentals uh, become a lot more obscure without the intermediary who, who would enforce uh, the revelation of the disclosure of such financial reports so this is another important role which established stock exchanges um, fulfill in, in, in the existing financial markets. Um, and we already see that in OTC markets, some of those are already quite popular uh, electronic platforms. So it's not true that you necessarily need to search for a counterparty. There are electronic OTC platforms which don't have transparency requirements or have very weak transparency requirements. And we see that those markets are a lot less liquid. Okay, so I believe this finally concludes our discussion, only 25 minutes late. So we looked at the connections between corporate governance and financial markets today, and uh, we looked at a few issues related to digital markets and cryptocurrency and blockchain. And next week, we will be looking at high frequency trading as advertised. So thank you for being here. Sorry for going over time. As usual, I will stick around for questions for a few minutes. So if you have any, go for it. No. Sorry, this. This.